Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon session, the last afternoon of our meeting. Um, I think it's going to be exciting as well, and uh, as exciting as the rest of the conference has been. Hope you had an enjoyable lunch. And now we've got two people who are trying to fight your after lunch dip. So um, I think they will manage it. Both have a teaching background. Uh, my name is uh, Rien Rau. I'm uh, working currently at the OECD, and I'm chairing this uh, session, uh, which is about what I would call uh, a kind of holistic promotion of the use of evidence in uh, schools and by teachers. And I call it holistic because it's trying, I think, to influence the whole, as Professor Higgins has called it, ecology of the use of research in schools and by teachers. And they're working through several strands, trying to influence teachers, trying to make schools and teachers more research engaged. Uh, so it's really an interesting example of an ecology-based uh, approach, I would say. Um, I will just shortly introduce our both speakers. Uh, firstly, first we'll speak James Richardson. He is um, working at the Education Endowment Foundation. Uh, he was a teacher for 10 years in secondary education before that. And then, uh, after uh, James, Alex Quickly, that's right, yeah, will take the floor. He is a teacher for 10% of his time, as I understood, and for the other 90%, he is currently Director of Research and Learning, as it is officially called, which is a really nice combination, I think, in uh, Huntington School in uh, York. In, it's one of the research schools of the Education Endowment uh, Foundation project, but we'll hear about that. He wrote two books on becoming a great or a confident teacher, and he is, uh, and he is consulted by many academics and by the government uh, on the application of evidence in classrooms. So a nice combination, I think, of a broker and a teacher, also in the role of a broker within his school and in a network of schools. I'll give you the floor for a presentation of about 15 minutes, and after that we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, Thank James, you. the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting us here to talk about um, the EF, but also um, the Research Schools Initiative, which Alex will go into in much more depth in a moment. And where I'm going to start, really, is where Steve left off yesterday. Um, but I want to just give a brief background to the EEF um, before we start focusing on how we support teachers to act on the research. So the actionable bit is the bit that I'm going to focus on this afternoon. And I'm going to do that by using teaching assistants um, as an example. Now, teaching assistants um, in the American literature, um, para-teachers, sometimes learning support assistants. And then Alex is going to talk about the Research Schools initiative that we're uh, in um, uh, collaboration with, uh, and then uh, looking at how teachers access research and the different models that we're testing at the EEF. So brief background. Um, EEF is an independent uh, charity uh, in England, established by the uh, Department for Education, established by the government in 2011, with a very generous endowment uh, of £125 million. Pounds. And the idea at the time was to put some money aside um, that can be used to generate um, independent, rigorously evaluated um, evidence that can then uh, be used by teachers to inform their decision making in schools. This is where um, Steve left off yesterday, and I want to go into a bit of detail about uh, the exact work that the EEF does. And it can be split into two, really. We have the generating evidence side, and then we have the using evidence side as well. On the generating evidence side, um, Steve spoke um, at length about the teaching and learning toolkit. Um, that is our way of summarizing the existing evidence that's out there. Based on 
that and based on the gaps in that evidence base, we then use that endowment, the 125 million pound endowment, to fund randomized control trials, uh, to plug the evidence base gaps. Uh, we then publish those rigorous evaluations, and as Steve said, that's then folded back into uh, the teaching and learning toolkit. We've published 66 reports to date. We've uh, funded uh, over 127 now. Um, most of those, as I said, are randomized control trials. Some of them are early stage pilots with a view to uh, uh, funding a trial in the future. The using evidence side, which is where I'm going to focus, um, is about going deeper than the toolkit. It's about providing um, a foundation uh, for clear and actionable guidance for schools. And we've published a number of guidance reports, which I'll talk about in a moment. We recognize that that on its own, again, is not enough. It's about providing practical support to teachers, um, whether that's through ongoing training, whether it's about having um, experts uh, uh, or online uh, tools to help implement that evidence. And then the final aspect is this idea of scaling up some of the programs that we've evaluated that have um, good uh, average indication of effect and whether we then uh, provide opportunities for schools to access those. So those three areas, the, the, the actionable guidance for schools, the practical support, and the uh, evidence-based programs, uh, really how we see schools using and acting on the evidence that we generate. And this is um, a broad overview of the EF and numbers in the five years that we've been set up. We have 7,500 schools participating in an EEF trial. So that is nearly one in four schools in England have been involved in some way uh, in a trial. We've, we're on track to spend 220 million pounds uh, over the course of 15 years, which was the original lifespan of, of the endowment. We've published 66 trials to date, and we have published them through our independent evaluators, and we have 25 of those, mostly drawn from the research-intensive universities uh, in England. There are quite impressive numbers of children involved, so we're, we're approaching 800,000 children have been involved in a trial now, and the two focused campaigns are two areas that we're taking that evidence and then really acting on it, and those two areas are teaching assistance and primary literacy. So on to, to teaching assistance, to try and exemplify what we're doing with the evidence. Um, a screenshot is of the, the toolkit, which um, uh, you'll be familiar with by now, and we find um, this average effect of one additional month's progress over a year. And there are two aspects to the research on teaching assistants. Um, one is that in, when TAs are deployed in classroom settings uh, informally, and they tend to uh, move around the room supporting children, on average, they, there's no particular benefit. Uh, there's no impact on uh, attainment for that type of deployment. Where they do show moderate effects, uh, moderate positive effects, is where they're deployed in structured settings, in one-to-one -one or individual um, uh, settings, uh, small groups as well. What we have found, these are, this is a, a summary table of six teaching assistant uh, interventions, all randomized control trials that we've published over the last two years. And if you look at the, the effect size column, you'll see a remarkably consistent uh, effect of the, the teaching assistant-led intervention. Uh, two, three, four, four, three, three months. And we're seeing that across all ages. So we're seeing it right from the early years foundation stage, all the way through primary schools, and into early secondary schools, which is a year seven for, for the English system. And again, as Steve mentioned yesterday, you see the various security uh, aspects to those trials in the padlocks on the far right. 
So we're getting a remarkably consistent message around how TAs can really have a, a positive impact when they're deployed uh, a, a, and supported in structural settings. So the evidence is pointing towards TAs being deployed uh, more effectively, but this is a pretty um, urgent issue for us in England. We currently have 380,000 teaching assistants in England, um, which is actually more t uh, than teachers in primary schools. And we spend annually five billion pounds a year on them, um, which is actually more uh, than we spend on roads and social housing in England. So it's a huge number of, um, of teaching assistants in the system ready um, to be deployed if um, if, if, they can be, if their, their behaviours can be adapted um, and, and, and coordinated for maximum effect. Steve mentioned the, the pupil premium investment yesterday. The pupil premium is the additional money that is attached to children uh, based on their, um, uh, their level of deprivation. And te what we find is that teaching assistants are overwhelmingly uh, used to support those children. Um, so actually how they're deployed uh, is, is of, of crucial importance. So we see this as a huge opportunity to work with schools closely to make sure they're having maximum effect. What the toolkit does then is it, uh, it provides um, an entry, a gateway into understanding uh, the large evidence base that's out there on different issues. What we then need to do is provide a foundation for scale up action, something that schools can act upon. So this was our first guidance report that we published in um, 2015, which tries to unpack those different studies. It tries to pull apart the evidence on TAs and provide really bespoke um, targeted guidance for teachers in the classroom. There are seven overarching recommendations. The Four recommendations in orange are around uh, the evidence on how TA should be deployed in informal classroom settings. The two in green are around structured interventions. And then the final one is around how the two are linked together and how TAs and teachers can work together. They're overarching broad principles. Um, and again, I keep saying it, but on its own, that is not enough. So what we've... Um, we've done is we've uh, invested five million pounds uh, in South and West Yorkshire, particularly deprived part of Northern England, to appoint what we call practice partners. And what those partners have been doing is they've been helping bring the evidence to life. So we've asked them to use their expertise to uh, work with up to 80 schools each, to really work with the schools to embed that evidence into practice. Now, these practice partners, um, some of them are schools themselves that have a large reach across the area. Some of them are local authorities, municipalities, and some of them are, are charities. So a wide range of partners that is taking that evidence. They act as guardians of evidence, and they bring it, help bring it to life uh, by helping schools make sense of it um, and working and training them to do so. What they told us is that the guidance report was, was good, it was great. The seven recommendations um, were really valuable and they provi provided that foundation for action. But again, they weren't enough. So what those practice partners did was they created additional tools and resources to help embed that evidence. And then we've just got um, a snapshot of four of them here. They're all available um, on the EEF website. There are 14 additional resources uh, and tools in all. We've got everything from uh, acting on the evidence cycles to a self-assessment guide, uh, a red, amber, green exercise to help you um, understand where you are with your, evidence, uh, with your deployment of TAs and where you might uh, want to move to. So a number of resources there to help embed that practice. The key reason that we've, that we've employed those practice partners is because 
we're starting to understand that for teachers to use research effectively, it's got to be a social process. It's as much based on the robustness of the evidence and the, 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 the various model that Steve talked through yesterday about applicability, accessible and actionable. But it's also about the trust and the personality of those involved in, in supporting the schools. We've realized that schools listen to other schools more than they listen to an external body like the EEF. Hence why Alex is here uh, to talk to you about his, his role in a moment. But we also realize that it needs that practical application. The provision of evidence on its own is not enough. It needs to be discussed, it needs to be understood, and it needs to be applied. Our research school network is designed to do exactly that. It's designed to take the evidence uh, out of the hands of an external body, like the EF or the government, and it's designed to put it back uh, to teachers where it's, where, who are best placed, really, to support other schools in understanding and using it. So our research school network is a very recent initiative, uh, launched only this September. We currently have five schools across England. <laughs> Uh, there'll be another six appointed before uh, September. And these schools are getting a substantial amount of money to help support up to a thousand schools between them across uh, the country. And what we're asking those schools to do are essentially three things. We think of it as a bit like a ripple effect with the, the research school at the center. The furthest ripples are around communication. Very basic um, newsletters, blogs, uh, tweeting, emails, um, but it's about finding a way to communicate effectively with those schools. The middle ring is around training. We know from the work that we did uh, in Yorkshire with the teaching assistants that actually how that, that evidence is packaged up into, into professional development training is critical. So the research schools are going to be training approximately 50 or so schools at a time in various evidence-based uh, approaches. And then the final aspect of what they're going to be doing is around innovation. So there, we know that there are lots of gaps in the evidence base. The toolkit shows us that. But we also, at the moment, don't have a system that allows teachers to take um, a, a, an aspect of pedagogy uh, or practice in the classroom and, and devise a robust, uh, innovative evaluation to test the effect of that. So the research schools are going to be organizing those um, innovative projects for things such as um, marking, feedback, the use of questioning in the classroom, the much smaller scale pedagogies um, that, that we lack the evidence for. So finally, before I hand over to Alex um, to explain a little bit more about actually what, what the research schools are doing and, and his experience of, of working very closely with, with teachers to apply evidence, we see our work with teachers and schools as, um, as a kind of a partnership, well, definitely a partnership, but it's one where we've got differentiated but coordinated roles. So the EEF brings the what. It brings the evidence through our work in generating that evidence. But it brings the evidence, um, again, echoing Steve's uh, framework. It's accurate evidence. It's actionable, it's accessible, but it's also appropriate. And the research schools, our practice partners, they bring the how. They bring the professional expertise. They bring the relationships with individual schools to be able to apply that evidence and practice. They are the ones that understand how different bits of evidence land in the messy world of schools. So together, we, we intend to kind of bring this evidence to life and embed it um, across the school system. We're very early stage, um, but Alex um, is going to talk a little bit about uh, his school, Huntington, and what they're doing to, to support that agenda. Alex. Thank you. <clears throat> Good 
Good afternoon. Um, I think it's probably helpful to introduce myself and my school to give you a sense of the context that led to us becoming um, a research school and working with the EF and the Institute for Effective Education in York. Um, I think it starts actually on a very personal, individual level in terms of my head teacher being very engaged and actually on a very practical level staying behind a talk at York University about evidence use um, for schools and actually my head teacher, John Thompson, engaged in a conversation and he wanted to know more and he wanted to be informed. I was struck earlier um, this morning just hearing that talk about what happens, you know, what head teachers decide to do in principalities and what local groups of teachers decide to do. And part of the, as James said, the research school program is trying to respond to that because actually head teachers' decisions ultimately drive what happens with evidence. And my head teacher was receptive to that, whereas other school leaders perhaps aren't, and that's something we need to um, focus on. Um, not only my head teacher, about four and a half years ago, um, I was leading a group of uh, an English department. I was a middle leader at a time of rapid change, changes in assessment, changes in accountability. Um, as you probably know, England's got a quite high accountability model. Um, and it, as a middle leader and as a teacher, I was very frustrated. I didn't feel like I had very good information. And I was constantly trying to juggle, supporting my team, changing curriculums, responding to these policy changes, which were quite literally overnight. And I felt like I didn't have any answers. There wasn't a body of knowledge that supported me as a middle leader. I understood my subject pedagogy, teaching English literature, but no one give, gave me expert training beyond that, really. So what I did as well, I looked outwards and engaged um, with Jonathan Sharples, who works now in the EF, he didn't at the time, um, about a feedback project we did. We were trying to initiate in our department because we wanted on a very small level to improve the quality of written feedback and oral feedback. And just engaging in that one project kind of opened up for me a sense of, actually, I could be involved with experts who could support me to make better decisions in my department. And on a, on a micro level, it kind of represents what the research school model is. It represents how teachers need to feel and see the differences and to actually understand the support mechanisms you can receive by engaging with evidence. And that led me to being more outward looking, um, utilize social media to talk about what I was doing, um, and actually started to integrate myself into networks, um, organizations like the Education Endowment Foundation, um, Cura, et cetera, um, that were existing. But for 10 years of my teaching career, I had no clue existed. And that's where, on a very individual level, our school started to be interested in evidence-based practice because it wasn't part of our leadership programs. It wasn't part of the formal way of developing a school. It actually rested upon individual school leaders wanting to be involved. Um, what that led to is um, us actually requesting, uh, bidding to run an EEF project um, as part of the knowledge mobilization round. So there were four or five um, projects, different ways. Some of them included conferences and sharing um, literacy information. The project that we devised, um, and that I still lead now, um, is called the RISE Project. And as it says there, research leads improving student education. Now, effectively, we created the title of research lead to try and establish that it, would there be a benefit, our hypothesis, would there be a strength in having a senior leader within a school having expertise around evidence? Because that role did not exist. That expertise in most schools does not exist. So could we support the school system by having a singular role within the school? And we tried to devise, well, we did, we devised training for the research lead to try and support them. And actually, they were almost a devil's advocate role within their school leadership, trying to inform the head teacher's decisions, trying to challenge and modify projects that were happening in school, trying to quality assure changes that were happening in school. So we thought, could we create training for this role? Um, and could we support schools um, to see if that made a difference? It involves 
um, 40 schools, 20 treatment schools, 20 control schools, and fun the fundamental um, treatment was that we provided a training program for research leads followed by ongoing support. So from January to the summer of 2014, we gave um, eight full day training sessions to research leads from 20 schools who all in invested and joined the project. And we based it around, this is the EEF um, school improvement model effectively, but it's kind of evidence in education model too. So what we tried to do is to use this as a skeleton for our training program and then our ongoing support. So step one, looking at internal data, professional judgment. Now, what we have in English schools is a model where data is driven by external assessment, by you know, the national testing. And actually, although very crucial to our students' success and their outcomes, often doesn't give us the best information about what we're trying and whether it's working. So we need to support school leaders in better understanding data and assessment. And we actually think that a huge number of school leaders in the English system need a lot of support around assessment, and that we're actually assessment poor in terms of our knowledge. We undertake lots of assessments, but our, our deeper understanding, summative, formative, diagnostic assessment could be better. And that when you put that as part of the evidence base, that we could support that. Crucially, we looked at the external evidence, and we had to train research leads to try and unpick, you know, trying to strip down um, a project and look at the evidence and look at what the data tells us and trying to contextualize that and understand and glean questions for their school context about whether it's useful information, whether it's usable knowledge. What we developed, and I developed the training with um, Professor Rob Coe and Stuart Keim at Durham University, we ended up with our eight-day training program being very much about implementation and good quality evaluation. Because what was happening in our schools, we were given, like when I was a head of English, we were given a directive, a change of policy, and very quickly, we had to make changes. And actually, we were doing lots of things. We were all very busy. The workload of the um, English teacher and senior leader is heavy. But whether we were implementing effectively, evaluating what we were doing, we were working harder, but not necessarily working any smarter. So our training focused on that. Now, the RISE program is still ongoing. So we're in now in the second year of the program, and now we just meet once a term, and we just have a meeting and support one another, and there is various evidence-based practice going on in the different schools, and it's variable, and it's being evaluated independently, so we're, we're working out what works. In, in effect, it, we're exemplifying this model, and we will get the results um, for that next year. But what that led us to, and what the RISE program is in effect, is on a small scale, it's a research school model that Huntington, we support these schools with um, higher education expertise to support us, and we create this ecosystem of, of support for school leaders, and we try and make the information that they get really pragmatic and practical, and we try and support them to create tools that work in their school for their teachers and for their leadership teams. And that led us to bid to become a research school, and the experience of RISE um, helped us a great deal, so we were accepted and we were one of the um, first five schools. So I think it's useful to understand the context and the journey that our school has gone on um, to become a research school. I don't think you know, there are a huge number of schools in England that would maybe perhaps bid for this role, but they wouldn't have the competency to be able to do it effectively. And I think I'm going to go back to... Um, James's expectations about what a research school does, and there needs to be specialist knowledge um, as part of the research school and support. So if I'll go back actually to this, that we have three aspects of our work. So we have communication, we have training, and we have innovation. And I'm going to just try and explore what we're doing as one of the five schools across our region in Yorkshire and the Humber, which is a very large region, and also there's communications beyond the region too. Firstly, communication. So as James said, 
Um, that's a core part of our role. What we know is that there is a lot of existing evidence, a lot of good evidence already out there, but school leaders and teachers either don't have access to it or they get a distilled media version that's probably not very helpful. And then when they do have access to it, then they can't really turn that theory into action because they don't necessarily have the tools or understanding to do so. So our communications are trying to help share and mediate the message so it's pract practical and pragmatic for school leaders and school teachers. So on the right-hand side, we just have one of the um, blogs, this um, What Are Children Reading? And that is just a short 600-word blog, a distillation of what was national research around children's reading habits. And what the national headline would tell you is that boys' reading performance um, was weaker, boys weren't finishing books, etc., etc. And that headline made it onto BBC News um, through you know, other channels that teachers would access, but it didn't give them the rich information they need. And actually, it might lead to some schools initiating a project around boys' reading that is baseless and not very effective in their context. So our blog, as, you know, as small as in the ocean as that communication is, was actually unpicking the research, because there were some issues around what they actually found about boys reading, because they took it from a program from Accelerated Reader, which is a very specific type of reading program, which actually, because of the intrinsic rewards, you get rewarded for reading more books. Boys might, potentially, skip books to get those extrinsic rewards. So that, that little nugget of fine grain information from the evidence is really important. Because if you just read the headline, boys aren't reading, that's not very helpful and actually could be a distraction or worse. It could guide policy that isn't very effective in a school. So we're trying to help mediate the research that comes out. So last week, the EEF released a few trials that made big news. So they made um, you know, the national news around breakfast clubs, around project-based learning, etc. And of course, we know that newspapers are looking for the quick headline. They don't necessarily read the 90-page evaluation that was painstakingly um, designed. Now, not every teacher is going to read that either. At best, they might look at the executive summary of the research. So it's our job to try and support that mediation try and support that um, communication, and asking questions. Our blogs don't give the answer, they raise questions for school leaders that are quite um, pragmatic. What we also have is a newsletter, which is only, we've only released our first edition, but just trying to have this regular communication for our region, spe specific for school leaders and their context, trying to bring out local news, as well as inform and share these national evidence-based news that maybe the understanding is rather low. Other aspects in our um, national context are we have, I think, a small pocket of highly engaged teachers and school leaders who are interested in evidence. So we have conferences and we have an organization called Research Ed, um, which sees a national conference in September where 500 teachers go on a Saturday to find out about evidence and to debate, etc., etc. So there is, there's pockets of really strong interest. In the last two years, we've held a research ed conference on Saturday at our school in the summer, and each time it's sold out, 300 teachers, and there's engagement there. But what we're very you know, very sure of, and what we understand is that is a pocket, a very energetic pocket, but it's still a pocket. And that actually, we need to reach far beyond that, and it needs to be an integral part of the system. So, as a research school, one of our jobs is to try and take some of these movements and try and normalize them, try and make them feel like they're for the school, you know, in whole, who's not really engaged with evidence. Um, in any way, and trying to make it feel personal for them. So our regional communication is trying to engage schools in this evidence-based movement and to try and normalize it as part of our school system. We have quite a fragmented school system. We have lots of different types of schools. Um, we have schools moving into multi-academy trusts, so um, individual schools 
coalescing with lots of other schools quite quickly. So it's a fast-moving system, but we're trying to support um, with communication. The second aspect is training. So I think what James captured is that having the research about teaching assistants is one thing. And actually, when the research first came out, the newspapers reported it in quite a sensationalist way. And it wasn't helpful, and it wasn't useful, and head teachers and school leaders couldn't make that into practice that made any impact on students and their outcomes. So what we must do is not just generate the research evidence, but actually provide the training and support and tools around that evidence that is actually co-designed by schools and the experts so that actually it's fit for use. And that's a core part of our work. So um, we are, the second bullet point there, we are running the program about making best use of teaching assistance in our locality because that already exists. There's really strong evidence about how we can support schools to use that vital resource better. But we're also um, doing various programs. So there's um, a local council, municipality um, equivalent um, in North Lincolnshire. We are in York. And what we're trying to support is research lead training in those areas. We're also offering support in terms of York, uh, offering out funding for projects. But we might spend 30,000, 300,000 on projects that are very well-meaning. But actually, if there's not enough expertise guiding those projects, they will likely have a lot of energy but not produce something that's very useful. So we're offering support to try and guide those projects too and draw upon our expertise and our research school network. We're developing a program called Leading Learning, which is effectively about trying to integrate evidence-based practice within school training systems. So continuous professional development. Because what we have, again, a fragmented system where individual schools and groups of schools are all doing different things around pedagogy. Some are using a strong evidence base, others aren't. And we're trying to support those schools to do better training. Alongside research schools, we have in England teaching schools. So we've moved away from this national model toward a school-led system where schools are training other schools. Now, that sounds great because schools understand the needs of their locality and their other schools. But it doesn't mean they have the expertise to do that very well. So our role, again, is a structural support for teaching schools. And by having that leading learning program, we're trying to, again, present them with the evidence, trying to make it actionable, and trying to provide them with tools, and tools for evaluation. If they're practicing and piloting pedagogy in their school, can they evaluate it better? We also are working with individual schools and clusters of schools who feel like they've got um, an issue and they want to develop their practice. Some schools have issues in accountability and need support, so we're offering that too. So our training is various. It, it's, quite, it's quite varied and specific, and we're developing it. But what underpins all of our training is a strong evidence base. That's the expertise we bring, and that's the expertise that is lacking, generally, in our school system. And then thirdly, um, supporting innovation. So I've already talked before about York, North Lincolnshire, lots of authorities, lots of clusters of schools have been undertaking trials for a long period of time. Huge amount of money spent on various trials. Some very good, some not so good. And our role, again, to support this school-led system is to try and support those trials, support those innovations. So fundamentally, a research lead has a good, strong understanding of the evidence base about how you might best implement that evidence and then how you could better evaluate that evidence. And by having that extra knowledge, we're actually working out what works with more understanding, and it's more school-facing, and we're connecting up higher education expertise and the research with practice on the ground. One of the projects that we're developing with the other 
um, with another research school that's down um, the south of England in Devon, Kingsbridge, is a self-testing um, innovation. What we're looking at is can the pedagogy potentially link to cognitive psychology around self-testing, quizzing, memory retention linked to that, can that be codified into a package to support teachers and we're both going to hold trials in our locality using the same resources to support um, teachers in science and history at a specific year in, in um, year 10, which is near it's the 1415. And we're trying to, again, bring our knowledge and expertise to an innovation that schools want this question answering. This isn't something being placed onto them as an answer. We've actually, we've got schools who want support, who want to be able to better prepare students for examinations, for the challenges of the new GCSE qualifications in England. So we're trying to create projects and innovation that is about what schools want to find out. So that's what we're trialling there. And then what we will also offer is the support around there is money, existing money for schools to run trials, but schools don't lead on trials. Schools are often done unto, and they are part of the trial, but they didn't ask the question in the first place, they didn't help shape the materials, and they weren't integral to that trial. And, and partially, that's one of the reasons why a lot of schools and head teachers can dismiss the findings, because they weren't, weren't integral to the creation of it. It wasn't a problem that they helped solve. So we're trying to support schools who are accessing funding to use that effectively. Okay. Now, um, I think it's really important that, and after this morning we had the context of the um, different nations, that how does this apply? What are your questions, fundamentally, about the system that we've just presented to you? And how does this ecosystem translate to other countries? Does it imitate some things that are already happening, perhaps? Um, or is the support factors currently in England, potentially the EEF and their toolkit, that are really important, and that those support factors are is what, what's of interest to other leaders in other countries? And then the second question, what are the challenges in getting teachers to engage and act on research findings? We've already presented what we know is that schools and school leaders and teachers listen to other schools and those leaders and teachers. Okay, the influence, you know, there's policy influence from national assessments, etc., but schools are making choices about practice in the classroom based on what the school down the road is doing and what they're telling them about it. So we've, we've presented some of the issues, but it's a broader question for people to pose in terms of what are the challenges in your context? And then there'll be some dialogue and some questions. So um, we've got about seven or eight minutes, actually, potentially, I think. Five. Um, I think seven or eight minutes on our tables um, just to discuss those questions and then after that we'll have a question and answer, people contribute, etc. and we'll dig, dig deeper into those questions and answers. Thank you. So if you discuss on your tables now.